This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good morning, everybody. Happy Friday. Welcome to Friday Fellows Conference. As you can see on the screen, our speaker this morning is Dr. Andrew Murphy. Um, Andrew is a, a first-year fellow in the clinical track, originally from Texas. Uh, he attended the University of Texas uh, for undergrad, did medical school at Baylor, uh, then University of Pittsburgh Medical Center for his residency. And he's going to talk to us today about, as you can see, coronary calcified nodule modification. So take it away, Andrew. Thanks so much, Dr. Williams. So um, like you mentioned, the title of today's talk is coronary calcified nodule modification with the subtitle making a task a little less Sisyphean. And so kind of the story behind that, um, so just start off with, I have no financial interest or relationship to this close. Um, originally, I was going to have a title, something along the lines of uh, making a play off of uh, coronary calcium and talking about how it's being stuck between a rock and a hard place. But it turns out that a surprising number of papers about this topic um, already have some sort of play off of that. I thought that was a little bit overused. Um, so I want to do something a little bit more out of the box. So uh, instead of referring to Sisyphus. Um, and so for um, anybody that doesn't recall from their Greek classics education, um, I actually got a lot more engagement about this from the title card than I expected to. Um, Sisyphus was a king in ancient Greece who was actually very uh, wily, clever, related to Odysseus and um cheated death twice, once death incarnate, and then once Hades. Um, and basically the third time that he made it to the underworld, um, Hades was very upset and sent him to a lifetime of pushing a large rock up the slope with the promise that if he was able to push the rock up and at the end of the slope and um, basically to uh, the regular world that he would be free and released from the underworld. And of course, at the end of every day, the rock rolled all the way back down the slope um, and he starts over. Um, so a Sisyphean task being used to refer to something that's futile, constant, persistent, um, and something that's toiling. So like, the, the effort with making that connection um, to Greek mythology is to show that this is something that uh, calcium modification of the coronary tree is something that's been um, overall not necessarily super successful, but there are lots of recent efforts that are being put forward to improve um, our success. So just a brief overview of my presentation. So we'll start off with the case presentation. I'll do a little bit of review of the etiologies of acute coronary syndrome and then talk about calcified nodule as a lesser known cause of acute coronary syndrome. Um, I'll talk about what is known about the pathogenesis of calcified nodules, especially given that it's a relatively recently identified uh, clinical entity. Uh, focusing a lot of my time on a a pathology study that came out just a couple of years ago that has a lot of uh, cutting insights in terms of where these lesions come from, a little bit about how the calcified nodule affects treatment plans and outcomes, and then talk a little bit about um, the modalities that are used to treat calcified nodule before I'm talking about the end of the case. So in terms of the case we're discussing today, um, this is a 71-year-old female. She initially presented to an outside facility with some chest pain. The chest pain was dull, non-radiating, and mid-sternal. It had been there for months off and on, um, but it was starting to increase in frequency and was lasting longer. She hadn't taken any nitro or any other medications, no other exacerbating or relieving factors, wasn't persistently worse with exertion, um, but then came into an outside facility after she had a particularly severe episode. There, her initial troponin was 126. It uptrended to 218 after one hour. So in terms of her past medical history, she has protein S deficiency with prior clot on DOAC. She has type 2 diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. Um, she had a prior hysterectomy and colostectomy. She doesn't have any significant family um, history of heart disease, no alcohol, tobacco, recreational drug use, no known drug allergies. In terms of her medication, she's under Roxban metformin, pantoprazole, a statin, a low dose of lisinopril, and then her uh, diabetic regimen. So in terms of her initial vital signs and exam, uh, as you can see, not significantly remarkable. She's normotensive. She does have um, a high BMI, consistent with obesity, looks euvolemic on exam, 
And then in terms of her initial labs, we mentioned the troponin that was uh, 126 that elevated a little bit after the first hour, normal kidney function, normal liver function, um, and then LDL is 77, does not have a white count. So in terms of her presenting EKG, um, we don't have a prior to compare to, uh, but as you can, can see here, she's in normal science rhythm, a rate about 75. She has some borderline left axis deviation. There's some small submillimeter SD depressions in the inferior leads with some T wave inversions, um, and then some smaller amplitude T wave inversions in the lateral leads. She did have an echo that was done at the outside hospital that should preserve subjection fraction with no wall motion abnormalities. So there, they started her on a low dose of metoprolol tartrate and then switched her riroxaban to a heparin drip and prepared to take her to the cath lab. So when she was taken to the cath lab, um, I'm just including images from the right coronary system. Um, they looked at the left and there was some mild non-obstructive disease. Uh, but as you can see here on the right, there is a very significant osteal lesion of the RCA. Um, it is, you can see that there's some uh, radio opaque dense pieces here that you can see even before contrast is injected. So it supports maybe some calcium that's present there. Um, and they called it a little bit more than a 90% occluded uh, osteal RCA. So she was, uh, it decided to be too complex of a case for their cath lab. She was stabilized and then transferred to Emory for further care. So just in terms of a little bit of background, I'm gonna kind of switch gears now to some background about acute coronary syndrome. Um, and just including this slide to highlight that this is something that's been around for a long time. And kind of interestingly, a lot of our modern terminology that's used has also been around for a long time. And our old friend Virchow actually described um, atheromas and described intimal thickening way back in 1858. So this is from a series of lectures he gave in, in Berlin in March and April of um, 1858. And so just kind of highlighting here, this is actually a, the aorta, so not the coronary vessels, but he's highlighting that there is a, um, a peak of this plaque here. There is um, some lipid collection and thickening in the middle and then showing that the intima is thicker and a little bit wider in the area with the, the collection of lipids and fat. Um, and also kind of interestingly used essentially like our modern terms of intima and media instead of calling it the internal coat and middle coat of the blood vessel. Um, and then again, just highlighting the fatty degeneration of this kind of middle coat here. So fast forwarding a little bit, um, these pictures are from um, a, a landmark paper that was done in 2000 that looked specifically at what was known at the time about acute coronary syndrome and some of the histology for um, plaque rupture, plaque erosion. And then this was actually the first time that the calcified nodule was described in this paper. So it was known that there was advanced calcification, but there was it was unknown whether this had anything to do with stable ischemic heart disease or acute coronary syndrome. And so more attention was paid to it uh, Pretty much from this point forward. But just overviewing that in the setting of plaque rupture, they start off with a necrotic core with a lipid pool that has invading macrophages, um, an interrupted cellular matrix interstitium. Um, as the cells here apoptose, it gets more inflamed, there's more necrosis, the smooth muscle cells die as well, and it starts to get bigger over time. Um, and these are more vulnerable to rupture when the fibrous cap gets thinner and thinner. And then ultimately, once the fibrous cap ruptures, all of this inflammatory debris is exposed to the blood flow, which then causes thrombus formation and causes ACS off its STEMI. Um, the other frequent situation that we know a lot about is pathological intimal thickening, a um, situation where the intima continues to thicken over time. And eventually there can be um, disruption of, of the endothelial lining here with superimposed thrombus and then also causing uh, more frequently end STEMI in that setting. So this paper was unique back in 2000 because it first formally described the calcified nodule, which as you can see here um, is this convex protrusion into the lumen. Uh, it did have associated thrombus and then also was associated with end STEMI. So this is in contrast to 
fiber cusset plaque, which I think is something we, we a little bit more classically associate with uh, calcified lesions, where this is much more concentric, it's more concave, um, and then causes lesion narrowing, but isn't something that's associated with thrombus, thrombus formation, um, and then not specifically associated with ACS. Some distinguishing features, and I'll have to highlight them a little bit more in the next slide, but uh, as you can see, there's not an overt, there's not uh, intimal disruption away from the calcified nodule, there's not a large tear, it's really just at the site of the calcified nodule that the intima is disrupted and uh, a nidus for acute coronary syndrome. Uh, and, and where we'll talk a little bit about today is really the origin of kind of how, how this starts to begin with and what's known about the, the pathogenesis about these lesions. So the characteristics, and this is how it was defined at the time, and there's been a lot kind of more said to, to define these because there's a little bit of gray area, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment, which is why the, the diagnosis is sometimes kind of difficult to make. Uh, but these are heavily calcified lesions with a calcified leading edge. They always have a convex protrusion into the lumen. Uh, and this is in contrast to a plaque erosion, which can have vessel narrowing and can have calcium, but just as endothelial disruption that causes thrombus formation as opposed to the convex protrusion to the lumen. It's typically an irregular jagged surface. And then there's often calcium deposition proximal to and distal to the lesion. Uh, that's also kind of a hallmark. And then there's a platelet fiber thrombus that develops because of it. Um, this sounds a little bit uh, like semantics, but it's important to mention because of how these are discussed in literature that there are two, and I'm so sorry that they're collecting the garbage just outside of my apartment right now, uh, but there are two separate clinical entities. There's the calcified nodule and there's nodular calcium. Um, and, and I will say as well, that kind of depending on where you look in the literature, there's actually quite a bit of variation in terms of how these two terms um, are used, uh, but I'm gonna use the definitions that are in this uh, landmark paper that I'm describing a little bit later in this talk that are the most consistent with what I, I've seen the most frequently in, in the majority of the other literature, which is that a calcified nodule is a lesion that specifically has fibrous cap disruption and often is associated with ACS. And the fibrous cap disruption is the really important part of that lesion. Uh, it's even sometimes referred to as an eruptive calcified nodule to emphasize even further that there is some disruption of the fibrous cap or a calcified nodule with disruption. Um, and that's contrasted to not with disruption. Um, when it's when there isn't fibrous cap disruption, that's more accurately called nodular calcium. So it has all the same features. It's convex. It's got significant calcification, proximal and distal to the lesion. Um, it protrudes and can cause symptoms, but importantly, again, does not have fibrous cap disruption. And the last point here is kind of what I was alluding to before, that part of the reason why this is so difficult is that on IBIS, you can't actually distinguish between the two of them um, because of how thin the intima might be. Uh, it's very difficult to tell specifically if there is any fibrous cap disruption. OCT is uh, better able to distinguish between the two. Um, and so that's why, because this is such a recently noted clinical entity, that there really hasn't been, um, as of yet, 100% consistently consistency in terms of how they're defined in the literature. Um, so just briefly talking about uh, part of the reason why calcification is, is complex and kind of uh, hard to nail down, it's, it's known that patients with a higher calcium burden have a higher risk of uh, coronary events in the future when taken in total. But it's also known that for a given plaque, such as a fibrocalcific plaque, those are more dense and more, more stable and don't lead to ACS and are less likely to rupture. Um, and that even uh, statins might be one of the causes to, to attribute this to, that as the atheroma volume decreases for a given lesion, the relative calcium percentage increases um, as the, the atheroma level volume decreases. Um, so then it's kind of this question of what's going on. Is calcium good or calcium bad? Is calcium stabilizing or is calcium lead to other uh, lesions? And of course, it's a little bit more nuanced than that. Um, and then this other, this final point is kind of worth emphasizing as well, that for a given um, thin cap fiber atheroma, something that might end up rupturing, if there is a small amount of calcium in the intima, that that might actually be the nidus for the rupture itself. 
So again, at the end of the day, it's kind of um, unclear. It's not that um, calcium is always stabilizing or always um, destabilizing on that cellular level. So then talking about where, where all this calcium comes from to begin with, because obviously it's not initially part of the coronary tree. There's been a ton of basic science um, in the past couple of decades dedicated to figuring out exactly how it starts. Um, at the end of the day, there's three mechanisms that have been identified, and it's probably some combination of the three. It's unclear if one is the, the dominant force or not. Um, but kind of the three different processes that are identified. One is smooth muscle cells that, for whatever reason, the milieu that they're in differentiate into um, osteogenic progenitors and then start to um, develop calcium phosphate crystals. There are also extracellular uh, matrix vesicles that have identified that, again, might be secreted more in given cellular circumstances, depending on the milieu. Um, and the other major uh, pathway that's been identified is that macrophages and smooth muscle cells can apoptose, and that after they apoptose, that those often can calcify. And then the other major hint that we'll learn a little about today is about how if there's a plaque rupture that heals, and obviously doesn't result in um, doesn't result in death, that those lesions frequently have calcifications that are identified afterwards. Um, there are a couple of major identifications of the size of the calcium, um, and I include these because prior to this, this landmark paper, that this was a lot of what the assumption about what happened to cause nodular calcium and calcified nodules. Um, when calcium is at its smallest, between uh, 0.5 micrometers and 15 micrometers, uh, when it's a little bit larger, it's um, called punctate calcium, 15 and a millimeter, fragments greater than a millimeter, sheet calcium, um, will come up frequently in this talk. It's extended beyond one quadrant of the vessel or three millimeters circumferentially. And so nodular calcium was thought pretty much to just be when all of these fragments kind of mashed up and happened to be um, collated and occur in the same place and um, superimposed upon each other. And the thought was, okay, if this happens over time enough in a, a given specific place, that that might be what causes these to form uh, nodules, which ultimately wasn't that satisfying an explanation because it's why, why, why would this happen any more frequently at one specific point in the vessel as opposed to a little bit upstream or downstream. Um, and so there, there have been other autopsy studies prior to, to the current one that showed that the prevalence was between five and eight percent, depending upon what data set that you look at. So if you look at patients that presented with ACS and then passed away because of the ACS, about 5% of those patients were found to have calcified nodules uh, that were thought to be the culprit for um, the patient's death. But then if you look at patients that present with ACS, not during autopsy studies, but uh, with the, when they're examined with OCT, this is about 8% of the time that they're found to have calcified nodules. Um, and obviously there's this cue in this data set as well, because if someone's presenting with a huge STEMI or a high risk end STEMI, they're probably not necessarily gonna do um, a whole bunch of OCT before and after to diagnose, uh, to take a closer look at the lesions. So there's probably a skew to a little bit less ill, a little bit more um, end standing patients in that, in that set. Um, and then there's been lots of data to show that these lesions are much more frequently found in patients with CKD, diabetes, hypertension, and advancing age, which is a theme that we'll touch on um, a couple of times. So now moving on to some images. So this shows um, OCT kind of what we described before, that there's this long or large convex protrusion with a leading edge of calcium with all this backscattering um, that, that's very jagged. And you can kind of imagine that there's uh, entomal and endothelial uh, lining that's intact here, but then it's disrupted. And then with all of this um, jaggedness, that that's uh, likely to be a source of thrombus um, that can cause ACS. And so this is what a similar lesion would look like on IVIS. So this is a picture of sheet calcium, just proximal to the lesion. And then this is, again, a convex, jagged edge um, of eruptive calcium that's coming through the internal lining. So moving on to the paper that we'll talk about a little bit. So like I said, this came out in 2021. It was a, um, an autopsy um, study that uh, they did path. Uh, analysis on some advanced calcified lesions. It's specifically focused on the ones um, that were found to have calcified nodules. Um, so just a little bit of data about um, the sample. It, this is from the CDPAP Institute. They looked at patients who experienced sudden coronary death. So that's patients who experienced sudden cardiac death that was later found to be um, due to coronary thrombosis, which is about half of all sudden uh, cardiac death. They looked at 26 consecutive calcified nodule lesions um, 
from 25 subjects and that this was 3.6 percent of their cases again a little bit of a skew because these are patients experiencing sudden coronary death um, as opposed to acs and they did a couple different types of analysis and imaging um, so this is this is what they saw we've got some um, imaging of what the uh, coronary tree and you can tell that there is um, a, a great amount of calcium, especially in the proximate RCA, and then at the left main bifurcation proximal LED. And this is at the site of the nodule itself. You can see that there's this large convex protrusion that's going into the vessel. There's some associated thrombus there. This is just a little bit more distal to it. And what they're highlighting is that, that in these sections, so B and C are proximal. This is the lesion, and um, F is more distal. What you can see is that there's these large circumferential sheets of calcium that are present and wrap like nearly three quarters of the way around the vessel lumen, uh, proximal and distal to the lesion. And this is an important feature that they saw consistently um, in this paper. You can see that uh, the, the kind of darker purple here, this is the uh, some of the calcium fragments. And then there's also thrombus kind of interspersed within the, the calcium. Uh, but you can see that it's all, it's very fragmented. It's very small, sharp, kind of jagged fragments of calcium, as opposed to these large, kind of smoother sheets of calcium. Um, so that was with H&E. This is with a different stain specifically for collagen. And this was another one of the big findings of this paper. So looking proximal and distal to the lesion, they saw that there was basically a complete absence of collagen at the site of the calcified nodule. Um, with the presence of collagen, even on the same uh, slide, that it would be found on other parts of the intimal lining, but not where there was fibrous cap disruption to begin with. And then again, a little bit more detail. This is an embossed look, the, and then some uh, micro CT along with the, the path findings, that there's all these pulverized calcium fragments that are found at the nodule and then smoother circumferential calcium sheets that are proximal and distal to the lesion. Um, so just kind of wrapping up a little bit about what their, what their findings were, they showed every single calcified nodule they looked at for this data set, they did have fibrous cap disruption and there was some protruding nodule calcium. The culprit sections had a lot more positive remodeling. They had a larger plaque area and then more of the intima was occupied by calcification. Um, this was also somewhat of a confirmation of, of previous findings that many of these lesions were found in specific parts of the coronary tree, specifically in the proximate RCA, and then another uh, probably at the left main bifurcation, about 20%. Um, and a lot of that's thought to be related to the motion of the heart during the cardiac cycle, which I'll talk about in just a moment, in terms of why those specific locations. And then they again showed that there was a high, higher chance of these patients having diabetes, advancing age with a mean age of 70 for those with calcified nodules, CKD, especially ESRD, and then hypertension. And then there was an equal gender distribution amongst these patients. So this was looking specifically at kind of what I mentioned earlier about the collagen versus um, necrotic core um, for the, the actual calcified nodule itself. They found that at the, the site of the calcified nodule, most of those calcium fragments were actually associated with the necrotic core. So the lesion that's kind of most likely associated with um, black rupture and STEMI, that kind of what was alluded to before, this may be associated with a, a previously healed plaque rupture that then calcifies. Um, and this just shows that between sections that are taken from um, culprit arteries and sections that are taken from non-culprit arteries, there is a much higher amount of um, calcification associated with necrotic core as opposed to uh, calcified sheet um, with, with associated collagen. Another interesting finding was they saw that there was intraplaque hemorrhage in about 40% of the calcified nodule lesions and that they had an absence of uh, collagen matrix if there was a necrotic core. So this was comparing culprit arteries to non-culprit arteries that it was more frequently associated with necrotic core and less with collagen and sheet calcification. This is showing that even if you look at just the sections from the culprit vessel to begin with, if you compare the proximal and distal sections to the culprit section, that again, you're much more likely to see necrotic core, you're much less likely to see um, collagen calcification and sheet calcification. So really kind of highlighting that this wasn't just the, those characteristic sections that they um, pointed out, but those are characteristic of, of much of what they found over the course of the study. 
And so in terms of the, the cardiac motion that has to do with these exact sites, this is really like this illustration, the next one, where, where some of the most um, key findings from this paper that kind of what they surmised was that these lesions that are most the most vulnerable to calcified nodule formation and intimal disruption are ones that have a necrotic core that has all these calcified fragments that more than likely disrupts capillaries, cause more bleeding, increase the vessel, uh, increase the uh, lesion size, cause it to become more uh, vessel occluding. Um, but that the other significant characteristic is that they have these stabilizing, dense sheet calcifications kind of on both sides of the necrotic core. Um, and that eventually it's both the stabilizing sheet calcium with a ton of collagen and the necrotic core at often at the bends of a vessel, especially if it was a torturous vessel that cause it to pop through the intima and cause ACS. Um, and it, it kind of, I, I imagined it kind of like a blister package, blister like pop pill for a, for a pill that it's something that pops through the kind of foil lining and it's because it's stabilized on both sides that it's able to, to push through. Um, in terms of the forces itself that are acted upon, and this, this is specifically looking at if there's a lesion in a torturous part of the RCA, which is often where they saw these lesions. Um, normally, an atheroma is, is mostly subject to circumferential pressure, so that this is, this is a patient's systolic blood pressure, and if it gets too high, that there can be disruption or rupture of the endothelial lining and fibers cap. So in this situation, obviously, tons of arrows here, much more complex. Um, there is the, the previously noted circumferential stretch that's a result of blood pressure, but there's also the axial forces that are happening as the vessel is pulled in both directions. There's the cyclic bending that happens, especially if it's a more tortuous se uh, segment of the vessel. There's torque as each side of the vessel rotates left and right through the cardiac cycle. And then there's shear, especially as there's significant bends in the vessels with uh, the physical force of red blood cells moving quickly past the vessel. So it's just kind of highlighting that um, it's not it's not by accident that these lesions tend to form in places where there's a lot more pressure and a lot more reasons why if there are larger calcium fragments, they might be more subject to uh, lots more forces that break them down into smaller calcium fragments. So just kind of summarize their findings. Um, they have hypothesized that the calcified nodule likely starts at a site of an originally a necrotic core that might be the site of a healed uh, plaque rupture, that there are larger calcium fragments that then are pulverized and fragment to smaller ones. Their sharp, jagged edges also are more likely to cause intraplaque hemorrhage, more bleeding, more fibrin and thrombin and a platelet accumulation. It also um, enlarges the, the lesion that the flanking regions are more stable and have more collagen as well as sheet calcium that uh, stabilizes them and might actually be one of the reasons that the, the lesion itself pops through the, uh, the intima, that they're exposed to excessive mechanical forces, that there's a disparity in local tensile strength, again, because of the lack of collagen. And then all of this ends up with disruption of the fibrous cap, um, thrombosis, and then acute coronary syndrome. Um, so just kind of zooming back out again in terms of uh, what we are talking about today, that was really the, the findings of that landmark study of, that came out just a couple of years ago in terms of improving our understanding of where calcified nodules come from. So I wanted to focus a little bit more now on exactly what the data shows in terms of um, how these affect clinical practice, how these are treated, and, and the, the treatment methods that are used currently and are being investigated um, further to treat these lesions. Um, so just kind of briefly asking why, um, why do we need to focus so much clinical um, attention on, on treatment methods for these lesions? Um, and then the big picture is that they're most likely going to become more frequent over time. So patients are living longer after intervention, patients are living longer in general, um, there's large uh, registry data sets that show that the burden of calcification is increasing over time um, and that risk factors like hypertension, CKD, diabetes are already extremely prevalent and then especially obesity, diabetes are going to continue to, if trends continue to uh, become extremely prevalent. Um, and that these are the known risk factors for um, calcified nodule formation. And then also as the, the uh, population ages that these are suspected to become um, more common. And then that kind of affects the question, okay, well, so they're there. Uh, does it necessarily mean that they're hurting anybody? Does it necessarily mean we need to do anything about it? 
Um, and, and the big picture is it seems like anyway, and again, these are relatively recently identified clinical entity. And so there's a lot of um, research going into them right now, but it does appear that they're, they, they do deserve kind of dedicated uh, treatment techniques, uh, mostly because they are associated with various suboptimal outcomes. So it's been shown that if a patient has acute coronary syndrome and it's due to a calcified nodule, they have much higher risk of uh, recurrence of the ACS and then the, the need for target vessel revascularization. Um, this concept is important that instant stenosis and um, instant um, thrombosis are very closely associated with um, stent under expansion or stent malposition, and that in turn, uh, calcified nodules and nodular calcification have been closely tied to stent under expansion and lower stent area. So a very significant risk factor for instant thrombosis and stent stenosis. Um, it's been shown that patients, so this is these last two points are for stable ischemic heart disease, not for acute coronary syndrome, but that those with nodular calcium and a non-culprit lesion have a higher likelihood of cardiac death or MI than those without nodular calcium and a non-culprit lesion. And then MACE has also been shown to be higher, um, even when comparing um, to other culprit lesions with non-nodular advanced calcification. So kind of stated a different way, if you look at two patients um, and they both have advanced calcium, if one has specifically nodular calcium or calcified nodule compared to another patient that has advanced calcification that's not nodular, that that patient with a nodular calcium is more likely to have um, MACE in the short term. Um, there are a couple of mechanisms that are thought to be at play here in terms of why the outcomes are worse and why there's room for improvement. The big one that was mentioned earlier, stent under expansion, if you can kind of imagine a, a D-shaped vessel, there's not going to be necessarily laminar flow through that. There's going to be a lot more turbulent flow, um, much more likely to cause thrombosis, maybe a little bit flow, uh, slower flow, um, and then buckling of the stent as a direct result of the uh, calcified nodule. Um, what this can also result in is if the stent is fully expanded at the time of PCI, um, it might be fully expanded at the portion where the calcified nodule is. But if you can imagine kind of the sections proximal and distal to uh, where that calcified nodule is, it might not be making full contact with the rest of that vessel. So kind of, again, predisposing to future events, uh, specifically instant th uh, thrombosis and restenosis. Um, calcified nodules have also been shown to cause um, stent fracture. There's also the question of whether they, with all the jaggedness of their edge, if they can completely disrupt whatever polymer or whatever um, drug is on the stent that's supposed to be alluding to begin with. And then in terms of a couple more mechanical compl complications that you'd be aware of at the time of PCI itself, there can be edge dissection that's seen, there can be perforation um, that has been seen frequently that calcified nodules can protrude through stent stress itself. So despite our best efforts, they can literally just kind of poke through where um, the set struts are meant to be. And obviously, if someone has um, symptomatic coronary disease or ACS as a result of the calcified nodule, and then uh, you stent it and the calcified nodule goes directly where um, you meant to, to enlarge the, the luminal area, you really haven't made any change whatsoever. Um, and then kind of interestingly, with this last point, there have also been uh, calcified nodules that have been noted de novo within um, a stent neointima. Um, again, just showing that, that this is something that kind of happens over time and is associated with advancing age and inflammation. So just shifting gears a little bit to treatment methods, I'm gonna talk about uh, the few that are a little bit more frequently used for specifically calcified nodules, um, but I'm going to mention all of the techniques, there's about five that are, that are used in the setting of advanced calcification, but not necessarily for calcified nodules. So the first one would be um, rotoblader or rotational atherectomy. That's uh, so how it works. And I'll have a, a video in my next slide, but it's a, a diamond coated burr that spins very, very quickly. It cuts on the front end. Um, and then this and orbital atherectomy use um, a, a principle known as differential cutting or sanding um, to explain why they tend to ablate more of the calcium and densely calcified material as opposed to the elastic kind of vascular um, intima and uh, other layers. So the idea is that it is going to bounce off and not ablate your native vascular tissue, but then will ablate the inelastic and calcified material. Um, just some of the other characteristics of it, it's only front cutting, and then it rotates between 140 and 200 events times per minute, and then is well suited for severe narrow calcification in which you can only pass by guide wire. 
Um, and so this is, these are a picture of the burrs. This is a picture of the actual um, device that's operated uh, by the operator. And then the setup that shows you the RPMs and gives you uh, warnings. And so as you can see, they were able to, to pass their guide wire. Um, and that's the only thing that needs to go through. There's no nose on the device. There's just the burr. Um, it spins concentrically. You can kind of tell that there's this pecking motion that's used. So a tiny pass that's done, operator comes back, tiny pass, operator comes back, tiny pass. Um, that's generally um, kind of what the technique is. And uh, again, pointing out that there's the drive shafts back here, and that that's much thicker than the guide wire. So as long as the guide wire is able to be passed, it's able to be used for lesions. So this is in contrast to orbital atherectomy with the um, diving back 360 being used. So the concept is similar, except that um, rather than it being uh, a single front cutting burr, that it's a drive shaft with a nose with, again, a, a diamond coated crown that rotates in kind of a larger orbit. I mean, I'll, I have a video of that in my next slide, but because it's eccentrically mounted, um, it won't just rotate in one spot, it'll rotate around the entire um, circumference of the vessel. Um, I guess like relatively speaking, this versus rotational, um, atherectomy. Um, it can be used for larger vessels because theoretically it'll spin again throughout the entire um, circumference of the vessel. It's less likely to be trapped because the, the burr is a little bit smaller. Um, but you can do bidirectional cutting because you're cutting um, both anti-grade and retrograde. Um, but then the big disadvantage compared to rotational atherectomy is that, um, and this is a picture of the device, if the nose can't pass through the lesion, then the lesion can't be ablated. So that's that's the big advantage of uh, rotational atherectomy versus orbital. Um, but same principle, there's a diamond covered burr that rotates very quickly um, and ablates the vessel in a, a concentric manner. And you can kind of see there's like a little bit more wiggle. And as it ablates the, the circle, the orbit of the, of the burr starts to get bigger and bigger. And so theoretically this can be used to ablate larger vessels. Um, the other major circumstance in which you would not favor the orbital atherectomy versus the rotational atherectomy is aortic osteal disease. So um, rotational atherectomy is favored um, in that circumstance. Um, so kind of moving on, this, this is one of the newer techniques, intravascular lithotripsy, and it's called shockwave. Um, so how it works, there is um, an electric charge that's delivered to this special fluid that's present in the balloon. Um, and then when it's vaporized, it generates this pressure wave. Um, and it's a large enough pressure wave to crack large sheets of calcium. And then again, like the common theme here, um, travel straight through vascular tissue without any harm. Um, it seems overall to be safe when compared to rotational atherectomy, and that's the setting of advanced um, calcified lesions. Um, and you use the integrated balloon to dilate the lesion after the pulses are delivered. Um, intravascular lithotripsy is interesting because they, the technology is the newest and kind of came out at the right time to where they are specifically, they're researching advanced calcium, uh, calcified lesions, but they're also releasing data, including a paper that came out just two weeks ago, specifically mentioning their safety and effectiveness for calcified nodules. Um, they've had four studies since 2015, um, and then this was just, uh, re they released the results of this pooled data set that showed specifically in patients with calcified nodules that it had, um, uh, safe, uh, it met its safety and efficacy endpoints, and that the procedural results were similar for those with calcified nodules versus those without calcified nodules. Um, and here are the fun videos from their website showing how it works. There's an electric charge that's delivered um, and causes these acoustic pressure waves. And these are little gypsum um, kind of pseudo calcified lesions that they're ablating in their lab. And then they're showing um, when the device is activated around uh, human skin and uh, more elastic structures that it doesn't cause any damage. And uh, hopefully this guy isn't experiencing any pain at all. Um, so real briefly, some older treatment methods that are used for advanced calcium. Um, it's the, the reason why I'm mentioning them, but aren't necessarily used for nodular calcification. Um, so one of the older technologies, the eczema laser that's um, used uh, basically to ablate dense plaques and calcium. It has this grid of lasers that are around a catheter that goes along the guide wire and um, is basically used to uh, ablate these, these lesions. Um, the issue with this is there were lots of dissections and occlusions initially before they started to uh, do flushes with saline to dilute the blood and contrast before they ablated. 
Um, so this was actually not necessarily um, a non-morbid uh, procedure initially. Uh, it's thought to be due to vapor bubbles that were released. Um, and again, not frequently used for calcified nodules. Um, and kind of the last two, there's um, modified balloons that includes both cutting and scoring balloons, um, with the principle being the same as a Jurassic lithotripsy, where you're causing a fracture in the calcium plate or in the calcified nodule that can then be pushed out of the way uh, with pressure balloons. And so how um, this particular balloon works to score flex by orbis niche, um, it uses a integrated nitinol wire and then the guide wire that you actually accessed the lesion to begin with comes back around outside of the balloon. Um, and then as the balloon expands, those two wires cause pressure against the, the calcified lesion, which then score it and allow you to use other balloons to, um, to treat the lesion. And then there are a couple of variations in terms of brands, in terms of whether the wires are, are arranged triangularly, helically. Um, and there's also cutting balloons, similar concept of scoring, but just uses these microsurgical blades. Um, the example shown here is the Wolverine cutting balloon, um, same concept of fragmenting these large classifications. Um, lastly, worth mentioning, because it's been used a lot in the setting of advanced calcification, but not necessarily for calcified nodules, is the super high pressure balloon. Uh, basically, it can inflate to a pressure a little bit more than double that of um, most other balloons that are used. Um, and there's this, I, uh, there's this uh, phenomenon noted uh, called dog boning. If a balloon is inflated at too high a pressure where the ends kind of flare out like a cartoon dog bone, um, but that these balloons are specifically designed to handle this high pressure and not have any flaring out at either of the ends. And again, this is not something that we used necessarily in the setting calcified nodule, because as you can imagine, this uh, if it doesn't fracture the calcified nodule, it could just cause a perforation or dissection, push the calcified nodule straight back um, through the vessel. So concluding our case for this patient, because they had aortoosteal disease, uh, it was elected to use uh, rotational atherectomy for this lesion. Um, as you can see, they did a couple of passes, and again, that kind of pecking motion that's seen for rotational atherectomy. Um, their initial angiography confirmed that there was 90% osteo occlusion of the RCA. Um, they were able to cross it with um, a run through wire, change for micro catheter, um, then cross it with a rotor wire floppy, then did two passes with a 1.5 millimeter burr and the rotational uh, with the rotor pro. Then they did IBIS afterwards and showed that there was um, confirmed calcified nodule with fracture in the calcium plate of the calcified nodule. Um, they did some non-compliant ballooning to pre-dilate prior to the stent. This is an image just prior to stent deployment. Um, and then there was IBIS done um, after stent deployment to confirm that there was as little protrusion of the stent to the aorta as possible. Um, and then they did some post dilation to make sure that the um, ends of the aorta, excuse me, the aorta end of the stent was flared out um, and that there was full apposition of the stent with the vessel walls. Um, the patient was started on aspirin and Plavix in addition to their homes or relative with a plan to do that for two weeks. Um, and then with the plan to switch over to Zarelto and uh, Plavix for at least for the first year. Um, she was seen in clinic a few weeks later. She's been doing well. She's been chest pain free, no shortness of breath or other symptoms. She's been tolerating her um, anticoagulants and antiplatelet well without any issues with bleeding. And uh, overall, it's feeling good. So in summary, calcified nodules are relatively uncommon but increasingly recognized cause of ACS um, with the prevalence that expected, is expected to increase over time. They're most commonly found in patients with diabetes, hypertension, CKD, and advanced age. They are most frequently found in the proximate RCA left main bifurcation, uh, areas that are exposed to a lot of mechanical stress, and then often at a site of necrotic core with an absence of collagen. They complicate our treatment decisions, both in a stable ischemic heart disease and ACS, and they are an active area of research in terms of the optimal treatment methods. Um, and I just wanted to offer a special thanks to Dr. St. Sara and to Oak, who both had a lot to offer in terms of the idea for this talk um, and then guidance along the way in terms of things to include. Um, here are my references. Thank you, Andrew. Very good review uh, on a very interesting topic that uh, it's good to see. Um, you know, in the years since I was in the cath lab more often or as a fellow that certainly there's been advanced advancements in treatment of these very calcified lesions where uh, 
back in the in the old days, a lot of times, we, you know, we would just say, yep, too calcified, you know, tough luck sort of thing um, for the patient. Um, so my question, though, is it's, it seems as though these um, treatment modalities you, you described, they do improve sort of long-term uh, outcomes in terms of, you know, you get sort of better procedural success and, you know, probably things look better in the long term because um, uh, you get better stent opposition, et cetera. How does that, how would you balance that though with the increased risk of short-term intra-procedural complications with these? Um, yeah, you know, so with these, I, these I think in, in this situation, it's a lot more, uh, it's a lot more tempting to modify a lesion in the setting of ACS. Um, I feel like if that's, if it's specifically something that seems like it's going to advance or might thrombose off, that that, that makes it a little bit more uh, kind of tempting to target, but completely agree that if, especially in the setting of stable ischemic heart disease, it seems like something where you wouldn't want to do anything ad hoc. You'd want to discuss with the patient, make sure that they know this is, you know, a higher risk procedure or something that that might make you feel better. We're not really sure. And then might not even improve your, your mortality. Um, so I, I think in, in this uh, particular situation, when the patient was transferred just for this, um, this, this was something where she was having like a progression of her symptoms and then did have um, positive enzymes where I feel like it was, it was just a little bit more lent to, to doing a little bit more aggressive care, but uh, completely agree there, none of these procedures are, are without risk. And especially um, for the, for the rotablator that there's um, all sorts of kind of um, adverse outcomes that you have to be aware of in terms of slow reflow or no reflow or you know, bradycardia that can happen just because um, essentially, I don't know, to me, it's basically like a dental tool that's being used in the, the coronary tree. And so it's, I don't think it's surprising that there's uh, necessarily a higher risk for immediate complications with it. All right, we'll get other questions from the from the audience. Uh, Andrew Stan Sherman, is there any data about uh, doing this versus just going ahead and bypassing? Uh, not that not that I have seen specifically for calcified nodules. Um, what, what's kind of interesting is that um, so that there's only a few papers that's just like outside of case reports, case series, it's only a few papers that actually look at outcomes at all for calcified nodules, just because it's been identified so recently and really as they've been looked at more under OCT to confirm that they're calcified nodules. Um, so I, I haven't seen anything like that so far, but just to kind of even put more of a point to it, um, I, I was only able to find two papers that looked at a large set of patients and specifically looked at um, outcomes data for, for two different techniques. So that was for the rotational atherectomy and for shockwave. Outside of that, there's very there's there's a lot of case descriptions, but there's very little actual um, outcomes data for this population. Good talk. Thank you. Hey Andrew. Robbie. Morning. How are you doing? Number one, Andrew, uh, one day I want you to come by the Echo Lab. I have a slide I want to give you that'll add to those beautiful slides that you had, number one. Number two, every time you fly over the Mississippi, you will, if you look out to the side of the Mississippi, you'll see these little lakes that have a crescent shape. And uh, maybe you know what they're called. They're called Oxbow Lakes. And uh, they're a result of years ago, there being a sharp turn in the river and then here comes a flood and it overflows the, uh, the, the proximal part of that and it isolates the lake and it calls, it's called an Oxbow Lake, great fishing places. But uh, if you look at the river as you fly over and you, uh, you look at a turn, you'll notice on that outer curve of the turn, there'll be uh, deposits of sand. And that reminds me of some of the things that go on the coronary circulation, the vascular tree in general, where shear forces are different and atherosclerosis uh, occurs. So uh, another thing, uh, just because the calcium score is high, 
uh, does not necessarily mean the obstructions. It may mean, mean there's some sort of compromise on the diameter of the lumen. You know, and I'm always remembering uh, one of our former famous beloved colleagues. We had him in the calf lab one time and I stepped on the furrow and I saw his entire left circulation. Uh, it was outlined by calcium and I said, to myself, oh no, there are going to be obstructions everywhere. As a matter of fact, as we looked at the left system, the LAD and the circumflex in the left main, we did not see a compromise with the lumen greater than 50%. He did have a lesion in his distal right coronary artery. So the presence of calcification does not necessarily mean uh, that you're going to find obstructions, although you know the higher the calcium score, the how the odds are that you're going to find some discrete obstruction. But anyway, that was great. I'm sure to come out of that le echo lab, I want to give you a slide. Thank you Will so do. much. Thanks for your comments. Hey, it's Peter Block. Can I ask a quick question or make a comment? Oh, no, no, you can't. I'm kidding. Of course, Dr. Block. Ask <laughs> so uh, just to you know, follow up on Steve's comment about that diffuse calcification, uh, back in the old days when I was in medical school in 1782, they called that Monkeberg's medial sclerosis. <clears throat> and <clears throat> the mantra uh, at the time was that if you had Monkeberg's, more likely than not, you were not going to have major uh, stenosis in your coronary vessels or in your peripheral vessels, but that this was a medial pathology and an adventitial pathology, but mostly medial. Uh, the reason I mentioned it again and bring it up <clears throat> is uh, Steve is absolutely right, but importantly, when you do a calcium score non-invasively, it can really fool you because uh, without FFR or anything else to tell you that in fact there are no stenoses, but this is all inside the vessel wall itself, uh, you may be terribly fooled that your patient is at high risk or something, but in fact may not be at high risk at all. So it's just sort of this uh, historical thing to stick in the back of your brain when you look at patients that are having CT scans to see if they have coronary disease, even at a young age, just a comment. Yeah, I think that's some of the kind of interesting, the, the paradox I was mentioning earlier that for a, for a given lesion, the calcium, for like a fibrocalcific lesion, the calcium actually is probably an indicator that it's a very stable lesion that has a shrunken atheroma volume that is, is appears more calcific because there's less, less of a lipid or necrotic core there compared to other lesions. Um, so for a given lesion that the calcium in and of itself is, is not is not the risk factor, but just that it's um, some specific patterns of, of calcium deposition that occur that, that can be a little bit, uh, that can play out a little bit different clinically. Okay, well, very good. Thanks again to Andrew um, for a uh, terrific talk and thanks everybody for tuning in and everyone have a great Friday and we'll see you next week. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.